All right, well, welcome everyone to our <coughs> monthly meetup slash webinar slash uh, knowledge sharing. And today we have Arena Soprin and Arena, you're gonna be talking about tools today. So thanks very much for coming and uh, sharing your knowledge. Um, Arena, I'll just raise, I'll go like this, but let's go to the next slide. <laughs> okay. Welcome everyone. Okay, so this, this webinar is sponsored by PNSQC and PNSQC, our theme for 2021 is quality coming together, meaning the different components of quality and all the things that make up quality, bringing them together in this year's conference. Our conference is a little bit unique in that we have um, papers that are published in our annual proceedings and so authors will submit abstracts and get to work with folks in our community to work on their paper. Uh, Arena was actually one of our authors last year and uh, won as one of the best presenters in the conference. So we're really glad to have Arena here. Um, PNSQC is an all volunteer conference. So folks like myself, as well as Arena, who's here sharing her knowledge are all volunteers. Um, and we're just sharing our own experiences. We're not consultants, we're actually working in the field um, related to software quality. So um, welcome everyone and we'll get started uh, with the real meat of the, of the conference of the uh, webinar soon. Arena, can you forward the next one? All right. So as I said, um, PSQC, we have papers and this year we've got over 20 conference papers which we're currently reviewing and working with the authors. We also have presentations. We have posters as well as our normal keynotes and invited talks from folks like Arena who have won in the past or uh, folks that are well known in the industry in presenting the latest in software quality. So, uh, like I said, PNSQC is, is an all-volunteer organization. So if you would like to volunteer and, and be one of us, we certainly would be glad to have you. We have lots of roles in the organization, everywhere from actually being an author and giving a presentation to being a program committee member. Uh, I am the chair of the program committee, and I work with about uh, 25 folks, 25 volunteers who volunteer their time in uh, reviewing papers of authors, as well as uh, when we have the live conference in moderating sessions and so on. You can also work with our team in operations, everything from uh, posting blogs to the website to um, working as a content contributor like Arena is doing in terms of giving a webinar or writing a paper for our membership. This is just a little bit about me. I'm the program chair. I've been the program chair for about four years now. This is my fourth year, I believe. And I, of course, have a background in software quality as well. I'm very passionate about it, um, especially with software uh, pretty much invading our life everywhere. Uh, we recently started working with a company that uh, makes speakers, right? So you wouldn't think of audio speakers as software, but they're actually a software company because you know everything is controlled by software now in the speaker. So it's really interesting. Um, but really today is about Arena. Arena is going to be presenting uh, a presentation on tools and... Uh, Looks like uh, I can't see you, your eyes there, Arena. It looks like um, <laughs> hiding there. But she's been yeah. speaking uh, for the last couple of years. Like I said, she won last year in terms of winning the best presentation at PNSQC in 2020. So we're glad, really happy to have you here, Arena. And I'll let you, if you'd like to supplement maybe something, what, what, what would you say that nobody knows about you except for after today at PNSQC? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> what, what's your uh, favorite food? How's that? What's your favorite food? Food? Yeah. Uh, ice cream. What, 
Ice cream. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'll let you take it away and, and start talking about uh, some of the tools that you've been experimenting with and using to help your team in, in test automation and many different things, parts of quality. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm really excited to be here and be part of PNSQC, a uh, very good conference. Uh, last year, I participated. I listened to uh, wonderful talks and met wonderful people, smart and uh, very uh, top in, the, in our industry. So yeah, uh, I just uh, want to give one disclaimer. Uh, slides took both my screens, so all I see is slides. So if you want me to pay attention to somebody, something, just let me know because I don't see Zoom windows. I just see uh, slides yeah, will, everywhere. <laughs> will, yeah, Arena, I will uh, moderate questions. So if questions come in through the chat, I'll kind of interrupt you and let you know that, hey, you know, John is asking a question about whatever. So I'll be here to help you out. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay, so uh, to my today's presentation will be consistent from two parts. First one, I would like to give like uh, some follow up, some following up thoughts about my uh, presentation on the previous year, and uh, some sneak. And second part is a sneak peek peek to my presentation this year. So let's begin. Uh, in two thousand nineteen, I became very interested in using AI in test automation. So I started digging for fun and uh, researching how tools using it, when and what are tools on the market. And I saw opportunity to use some of these tools at my current place to automating very complex end-to-end -end, uh, test cases that we spent a lot of time to run manually. Uh, these test cases are very tedious and very boring if you run them <laughs> manually every release. So uh, with that in mind, I started uh, like my research in AI-based test automation tools. So I will try to give you two minutes overview of my 10 pages white paper and one hour long presentation I, give, uh, I gave last year. So AI-based test automation tools mostly functioning on autonomy, test autonomy level two and three. And for those who are not familiar with uh, test automation autonomy levels, I just say that uh, there are six or five of them, depends on the source of information. I prefer six. And uh, zero test automation autonomy level means that you don't have automation. So basically you do everything uh, manually and human should do everything. And level five or level six is uh, means that human is not involved at all. You just take your software, feed to test automation tool and you get uh, Jira tickets with bugs uh, as the result of uh, testing tool, uh, as, as a result of it. AI-based test automation tools mostly work on level two and level three, so they eliminate some human involvement, but none of them reach level five, although some of them claim they do. Uh, I tried some of these tools that claim they uh, reach the highest level, but I don't think they did it. Maybe in some aspect, but not in uh, all. So most of test automation tools that use AI and machine learning, they use uh, it in supporting role. It means that you still need human to do work and uh, AI and uh, machine learning algorithm will make your life easier. There are very uh, exciting features, like for example, codeless script generation, recording test cases, converting test documentation to test automation, self-healing, which means that uh, some maintenance burden is taken off your plate. 
some of uh, tools can uh, build test cases for you, for example, based uh, by, by analyzing your software and the test, and uh, some of them analyzing user uh, behavior, again, based on logs or uh, just collecting clicks and then building uh, test scenarios on it. AI is used in visual testing to compare uh, your pages visually, and it's uh, much better than just pixel-to-pixel -pixel comparison because uh, tools that use pixel-to-pixel -pixel are very flaky, and AI helps uh, to solve this problem because uh, it compares screens with expected uh, uh, screen like, smartly. And AI is very productive in audio and video quality testing because it can convert uh, the subjective uh, prescription to numbers and say, for example, if noise level six, that means that human don't hear it. If it's like five, that maybe you should need to do something with noise. So that's my like two minutes overview of my talk. And uh, based on this uh, research, I pick up five tools that I look, look at very closely. And uh, there were Mabel, Testim Automate, Advanced Q, Functionized Architect, and Testcraft. After further consideration, we pick up three of them and uh, did a proof of concept like with real test cases with our infrastructure with uh, our software and uh, this three was were Mabel, Advanced IQ and Functionized Architect. After proof of concept we pick up Mabel and uh, it does not mean that it is the best it means that it fits our specific needs uh, better than other and uh, I just want to mention that some of, like, like one of the reasons why we picked Mabel has nothing to do with tool or automation. Uh, one of the reasons was like they have amazing support team, like I have never seen such support team. So that was one of the reasons. So as you say, it's not always even the tool, sometimes it's the team that <laughs> creates the tool. Uh, we started working on Mabel rollout, I believe, in the end of January. And uh, although this tool makes our life much easier, but nothing comes for, <laughs> for free. You still need to uh, invest time and efforts and uh, dedicate uh, some resources to it. So it does not matter is it... Uh, tools that use uh, your AI or it just any uh, automation tool, but you still need to integrate it in software development lifecycle. You need to integrate it in processes. You need to connect it to the ecosystem. You need to set up notification and slacks in the mail. You need to connect it to uh, test environments. And it's all still done by people and you still need to do it. All the AI tools that I tried are really easy to use. They have very intuitive uh, UI. The uh, test authoring is very easy, but it does not mean that no training or onboarding needed. You still need to learn the tool and you still need to master the craft because using AI and uh, machine learning in these tools impacts how we automate uh, some of the aspects. Impact, impacts what you mm -hmm. need to pay attention to when you automate it. How you need to handle uh, like, I don't know, element searching on a web page. So you still need to understand what's going on and what is the best way to use this specific tool. Test tutoring in uh, Mabel is uh, easy. Uh, you can record the test cases and uh, it still it, and it requires less time than like coding, but it still requires time and. Um, recording the test case is one thing, but make it stable. Uh, make uh, it the test recording reusable, for example, some flows in these test cases used in different uh, 
other, in some other test cases. So you need to think about how to organize your test cases, how to organize reusable steps, uh, where to use variable, where to use uh, data-driven test cases, set up everything. So recording is just a small part of actually test automation and uh, planning like test, test automation strat strategy. So you need to, still people need to think about it. AI does not solve this problem. And another thing that uh, AI and uh, Mabel solved very easy, uh, very good is locate, locating elements on the web page. So no more express, no more uh, CSS. Everything is done very user friendly. You just click on the element and Mabel know, knows everything about this element. So that's nice and this is something I really enjoy. So as usually with great powers comes great responsibilities and as any automation, automation that use AI based tool still requires maintenance. So self healing helps to uh, maintain, the test, maintain the test cases. So we spend less time on maintenance in terms of if there are some significant changes, for example, change in one of the uh, attributes of element of the web page. It was, for example, named, uh, I don't know, orders, and now it names orders ID. You don't need in this uh, case, go and manually update your test because uh, Mabel collects a lot of information about web page, about everything on the web page. So probably it will recognize that it's still the same element, it just labels that change. But it still takes time and need to be embedded in process because not all the changes can be fixed by AI if you go through the uh, significant uh, business logic change or UI change, you still need to go ahead and manually update this test case. Some of them can be re-recorded, so it's easier, but it still work. So it's it having self-healing does not mean that you never need to maintain these test cases. And since uh, since February, we went through two major changes in our UI and the business logic. So it it has been like two times when we already like invested a lot and updated uh, a lot in our test cases. Another caveat of self-healing that you need to be careful sometimes. Tests still need to fail. So you need Irina. to... <laughs> yes? Irina, I'm, I'm just wondering, so Mabel looks at doing test automation and it looks like it provides a uh, recording capability like a lot of automation tools, but you also mentioned that it somehow uses AI. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what, how does it use AI? So during the uh, recording, for example, it collects a lot of information about flows in application and it collects a lot of information about each element of uh, on uh, UI of the software under test. So for example, it use, it collects, I believe, 30 data points about each element. So about each button, about each label. So when some of these uh, attributes, parameters of the element are changed, uh, AI still can find this element. That's one of the, uh, like, use cases of AI. I also believe, believe because they, they obviously do not share their, uh, like, uh, what they specifically do, uh, but they have some uh, type of uh, link crawler, so Mabel can provide, like, crawling through the, uh, your application smartly, not just randomly clicking, and they also collect in information about application, what page is usually goes after this page in the user flow, what page... Uh, mm -hmm is used the list so they collect all this information and process process it and make uh improve test stability and maintainability sure that's that's kind of interesting because you know one of the biggest 
uh, headaches in maintaining test automation is, you know, elements that move around or change or change names or things like that. And so you want AI to help you self-heal your tests, but then I look at your slide and it says, oh, you want them to fail too. <laughs> you want to disable, disable the self-healing. So I'm, I'm kind of curious how, how you know when to disable the self-healing and when to use it. So part of this was just uh, learning and watching our test cases. So, for example, we operate with financial information in some degree. So we, we have prices, we have uh, data that should be always there and the same. And this data should be the same on all the screens. So we need to disable self-healing, for example, when we need to verify that this label says $100, for example, and this label should say $100. So never try to replace or self-heal when you see $99 here, for example. That's the one example. So you need to think what is crucial for your uh, test, for your application, and what should be always look like it it looks now and has certain text or be in the certain place on the page. Yeah, Irina, I have an, another question that came in. It's kind of technical, I guess. It's wondering what kind of AI is used. Do they use neural nets or techniques associated with, you know, typically associated with AI? Uh, you know, what is really meant by AI to begin with in terms of these tools? And they, they say, oh, we use AI, but what does that really mean? So they use different uh, types of uh, uh, different uh, uh, machine learning algorithms. Most of them, you know, they, all these tools are not open, open source tools. So I just can guess what they use. I believe there is some uh, neural networks. And uh, in my white paper, I have like a uh, uh, description what uh, algorithms are mostly used for solving this task or for this task, for this task. So you can find it in my uh, white paper. But again, I can only guess and uh, like based on some reading of uh, like maybe white, white papers and some uh, patents that sure. other tools that, shared. I think that's more of a question for the actual vendors that are providing the tools and they'll probably say something like that's secret, that's proprietary, we can't tell you our secret sauce. But anyways, <laughs> I thought it was a good question. <laughs> yeah, 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 they, uh, most of them, you know, does not share much because uh, I think they invested a lot of time and efforts in building these technologies, so they are not publicly available. Okay, sorry, keep going. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, so test need to fail sometimes. Uh, also, when you use self-healing, you need to make sure that you provide more details when you're selecting some elements. For example, if you have uh, multiple select, multiple drop downs on the page and each of them has select, you need to provide more details so my Mabel can distinguish between them and Mabel made, made it easy. Uh, but uh, you still need to work on this. And Mabel even gives you tips like give me more so next time I spend less uh, time to find this element. <laughs> and uh, sometimes we even, as I mentioned, we even disable it because we want to make sure that uh, this specific element is picked up. Do not look for other element. Do not try to self heal. Heal. We need to make sure that this is this element. This uh, label is here. We had like a very interesting situation when we one of our screens has list of very similar object. So they look almost exactly the same. It's very hard to distinguish between them if you don't know where to look. But the business logic behind them based on a couple parameters is very different. And we notice that uh, when we search for certain objects, maybe, uh, when we run tests sequentially, they all pass and all good, but they, when we run them in parallel, uh, they failed. And they fail because Mabel finds similar objects and think, okay, that's that will work. It's a 
looks almost exactly like I was told to, to search for. And it was picking up the wrong object. So we, in this case, we disabled like self-healing and made sure that we provide like as many details about this object as we can to Mabel so it does not try to solve problem that uh, does not exist. <laughs> So that was my uh, short overview of previous uh, pre previous year presentation of presentation I gave on uh, in 2020 and some learnings and some experience that we gain after this. And now I would like to switch to sneak peek of uh, my this year presentation, which is named Not Your Ordinary Testing Tool. So when we talk about testing tools or tools that uh, QAs use, we often limit our work by test automation tools. But it should not be so from, I think so, because testing tools include test management tools, test automation tools, CI/CD tools, software development tools. Most people who automate use different IDEs, use databases, uh, study code analysis tool, log management tools, and a bunch of different small tools that can make uh, your life as QA much easier, uh, that can help to make testing uh, Manumatic, so to help you manual test or uh, some cool libraries that can be used in automation. So I collected uh, some tips from my experience. I talked to my peers uh, on different uh, gatherings, virtual and face-to-face, uh, -face, and I put it together in like, some uh, presentation that I want to share with you this year. And uh, one type of the tools I will be talking with is uh, monitoring. I'm actually surprised that monitoring is not considered testing tools because from my perspective, monitoring is a test that you don't have. If you miss some test cases, monitor, uh, miss some cases and you are not covering one or another functionality, monitoring is here to help you. Usually, uh, people monitor only production. And I think that we need to start monitoring in QA. So if you're monitoring, for example, service health, if some service is down like 50% of the time for no reason in QA, what makes you even think that it will be up in production 99.9% .9 of the time uh, or whatever is uh, SLA? Uh, we can monitor for errors and warnings. We can monitor for non-handled exceptions. And uh, actually, we need to test monitoring somewhere because we need to be sure that uh, our monitoring will raise uh, alerts and will show us information that we need and the best place to start it to start in QA. I can share like experience from my uh, one of the previous jobs. We had monitoring, we had it in production, not in QA. And after one of the releases, we suddenly noticed that we have three times as many users as before. Of course, we could think that, uh, okay, our release was that good that we immediately got uh, three times as many users. But unfortunately, it was not true. It was a uh, memory leak and incorrect uh, handling of users and we caught this uh, case and we noticed it before uh, any of our customers notice it and we roll back fix issue and uh, roll out a new release with hot fix. So basically we did not have this type of test cases when many users join in the same time and they drop quickly. So monitoring caught Monitoring covered us for uh, this case we don't have. Another type of monitoring that uh, we can start doing in QA is uh, for performance. Often uh, people postpone performance and load test, and we can start testing it 
in QA, even if you don't have many users. You still can monitor uh, request time if uh, three, there are three users in the system and request time takes like forever for every request. Maybe there is something wrong with the system. You can monitor request numbers to say that uh, you don't have like 100 requests for one user or something like that. It all depends on the business logic. You can still monitor time to load. If it's slow in QA, uh, what makes you think again that it will be fast in production? You can monitor CPU, uh, memory to make sure that there are no memory leaks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all of this can replace in some degree performance testing and can help you see how your application behaves, even starting from QA, not waiting until it deployed to production. Uh, again, I will share much more uh, in my presentation this year with examples, with uh, graphs, etc. But just a sneak peek, so we will switch to another type of tools. Static code analysis. Again, this tool is somehow considered not a QA tool, not a testing tool, but developer's tool. And I would suggest even if developers do not use static code analysis tool, for example, like Sonar Cubes, you can still connect it to the repo and use it as additional testing tool because it shows you coverage of new code. So if you see that this feature is covered, 100% uh, is 95, 90, 70 with uh, unit test and another it just has like 20% of unit test uh, coverage. Maybe you need to concentrate on another feature. Maybe it's not that good. Modern static code analysis tools show you bugs. That they literally show you like here is a bug, here is unhandled exception, here is something that is uh, very bad, here is a possible null pointer exception. So you can uh, start pointing people to bugs and you can try to see how they uh, show in uh, like in UI after uh, so you can do some digging into this area and file actual bugs. Static code analysis show you complexity of the code and you, we know that the more thin, the more complex is code and business logic the more uh, chance that we will find bugs there. They show you smelly code, uh, they show you duplication. So they provide a lot of insights that you can use when you're planning the scale the testing. So you can divert your attention to the places when code is not that good and they provide a lot of insights. And uh, another few tools that I will be talking about is uh, are tools that I named my little helpers and the different tools that uh, can be used for uh, helping people to test manually or automatically. Uh, the one that I enjoy recently a lot because uh, I work a lot with uh, CSV files is a superintendent app. It allows you to work with these files like you would work with uh, database. So it allows you to write uh, SQL queries and operate with files using SQL query. So for me, it was like really helpful because uh, as I said, uh, our application uh, use these files and sometimes I need to compare data or make like join from these files because uh, different information comes from different sources and then we proceed it and put it in the table. So for me, it was like very useful app. Another little hel helper I use often is JSON parsers and formatters to see that JSON that uh, our, our software receives or sends are valid and at least parses. I will use a lot of uh, tools, a lot of comparing files to make sure that data from that comes from different sources is uh, good and uh, like 
there are no differences or there is a difference. So uh, it's much easier to use tools and uh, you, you of course can automate like comparing files, but if you don't have it automating using such tools helps. And the last set of tools, my little helpers I, would, I will talk today is like uh, test data generators. I use them even when I test manually because, for example, if I need a country, I just uh, probably will enter country that uh, I can relate somehow. So it will be like semi-random, but I probably will enter US or Canada or, I don't know, Ukraine where I'm from or Portuguese or Portugal or France. So something like that I'm familiar with. With, but I probably will never enter such country as Uganda. I, I, to be honest, I don't know where it's located on the map. I, I can guess, but you know. So it helps you to create like really random data if you need, or even give you some insights about data that you have no knowledge about. Like, I don't know, Netflix. Uh, category. I don't have Netflix, so if I need to test something about Netflix, uh, I have no idea where to what a category. So it can generate for you, like the, the one that I mentioned here, FakerJS can generate it for you. So I suggest that test data generator were used instead of uh, like random people generator. But uh, I would like also to say, like again, disclaimer that when you using any online tools, make sure that you aware of what information you're giving to it, because you don't know what these tools are doing with your information. So be careful. And uh, this is the end of my short presentation. And I am happy to answer any questions that you might have. All right, does anybody have any questions? Um, feel free to ask our tool expert, Arena Sopran. So, uh, Arena, I have a question. This is Deepak. Uh, about that the performance part you mentioned uh, for testing. Uh, so, uh, in the test environment, uh, so there's the always, in the challenge which I see always that the size of the environment and the size of uh, production is both are not similar. So how are you guys um, uh, able to manage that? Uh, how are you able to convince your team that we need that certain kind of environment where we can, we can do some, some, some performance testing as well? So when, you, when we do like performance in QA, we, as you mentioned, we have like smaller environment and less, less uh, has less CPU power, less memory, but uh, still application should be functioning like, properly. And for example, request like request time or data when you query something from database, it should not take forever. So if it overestimates, uh, if it over if it is over some level, like common sense level, you can say that it's something is wrong because like it should not take five minutes to load the screen. It should not even take minute, even if in, in QA environment, there should be like a common sense uh, performance even in test environment. And again, it uh, also depends on what you consider normal and what you need for your application. I work most of my time with real time uh, processing systems, uh, for example, in advertisement when you open a web page and there are like 400 milliseconds to do very complex logic that includes like live auctioning and uh, picking up uh, advertisement and loading it. So it's 400 milliseconds for everything and everything above it consider it long. So it also depends on your application. What do you need? So for us, it was no brainer that we need like very uh, test environment that is similar to the per, uh, to the production because we need to make sure that we can fulfill this 400 milliseconds requirement. 
So we use common sense. <laughs> That's short answer. Hi, uh, this is Ying. I'm taking over from uh, from Phil because he has um, another meeting that he has to attend. Um, we have a question from the audience. Um, it says, um, do you use any specific tool for mind maps regarding creating test plan or test strategies? I do use uh, uh, sometimes mind maps. Uh, to be honest, I don't use them often. So I usually, when I uh, in mood for some mind map, I just Google and pick up the first one that is free. <laughs> so that's my approach to using mind maps. Uh, I'm not a big fan of mind maps, to be honest. Like it just it, it's a technology and it does not work for me personally. Uh, it's hard for me thinking how mind maps are built. I I prefer like to draw and write and uh, write a lot. And this explanation, what I want, what I so it's just the way I think. Uh, that's an interesting response. I'd like to kind of throw in the parenthetical that I think the effectiveness of mind map to me seems a little bit culturally dependent, but that's my personal opinion. <laughs> yeah, so some people I've seen they are like use it a lot and they are very productive using mind maps and they have mind map for everything. It just does not work for for some reasons. Yeah. Um, I, I have a question. I once I saw in your LinkedIn page that some of your tools are used uh, in the context of uh, television um, ads, um, in terms of the ads buyers, uh, which are usually advertising firms. I I imagine, mm -hmm. and, um, and then of course uh, I imagine these things affect the uh, operations of uh, uh, TV um, origination centers and transmission facilities. Um, I'm just curious, um, a lot of the um, business rules for determining how ads need to be played must be specified by your client. So, so a good deal of these must be business rules. Um, do you incorporate some kind of a rule engines in, in your work to to support kind of diverse business rules from the different types of ad agencies or folks that would do the buying for um, for advertisers? Well, we have common flows for some of our, our uh, buyers and sellers. Actually, we have the common flow for our buyers, but different for our sellers. But some require like very specific business logic and very have very specific uh, requirements so we and because they all like big agencies so we have different flows sometimes for different sellers and buyers so depends on what they want and it's hard to use like some you know set of rules because one agency can like we are trying to convince them that you know guys let's do some unify way it will help industry it will help but some of them just, just say like oh no we want this in the uh, tv advertisement uh, area and industry is very manual like even now it's like a lot of like people trying to automate parts of uh, this uh, like deal negotiation. For example, we, we are working on deal negotiation, like uh, playing ads, but most of these processes are very manual. They involve real people playing ads on TV, like pressing buttons and stuff. So it's not very well automated area. So it's, it just started there. Um, if you think about, I don't know, insurance business, uh, auto insurance business, like 20 years ago, maybe not 20, maybe 10 years, when you need like person who will call to the some, uh, you know, <laughs> you need to actually call to one person and he will come up with one quote and you call another and like, so it was all like emails and calls and stuff. So it's, that's how TV advertisement industry now, it's moving to the automation, but slow. If I can um, kind of drill down a little bit on this question from the point of view of the 
um, transmission facility that have to insert ads um, into programming, which is of course a standard uh, need of uh, uh, transmission facilities. Um, at least in the United States, you know, um, cable TV and those folks that uh, reach into uh, the different neighborhoods. I mean, there's probably a trend toward ad insertion at the zip code level. Do those type of things affect your uh, work and and make AI and other tools even more important in the sense that um, as you uh, try to distribute ads, um, kind of more and more fine grain, you know, down to the the ultimate goal, of course, is down to the individual level, uh, like with Google Ads and whatnot. Uh, how how do you see the importance of AI related tools in an industry like uh, TV advertising, which of course historically tends to be like the same ad for all audience, but it's increasingly changing, especially for cable. I think it will uh, impact us more and more because uh, the more information we know about user and the more specifically we can pinpoint to the exact household who watching the TV and exact person who watch the TV. Uh, with like traditional cable, it's hard to do because uh, it's hard to know who is watching TV. Uh, maybe it's based on, just on the profiles, but there are no like profiles. So many of the, m a lot of this data is still coming from questionnaires. You know, like when you get like it's like paid stuff when you get like such thick uh, questionnaires, and there is like. Uh, you need to fulfill like the, uh, like your information. You need to fulfill how much inf you watching TV uh, every day, what shows you watch, and so a lot of this information about audience is coming from such sources. Still, uh, some of this information comes from devices that you uh, attach your TVs to, and uh, it like, users get paid, watchers get paid for like using these devices so they collect information about again about shows and about different households and how they consume TV. But with uh, digitalizing TV, we have more and more this information and uh, it's important, it, it will be important to like, distinguish between, like you said, zip code and stuff. Plus another thing that we need to think in the future is uh, when some company like Coca-Cola wants a advertisement cam campaign, they want to reach different users user using uh, different platforms, but they want somehow consolidate this audience. Like I want to reach, uh, I don't know, five million uh, users who are less than 18 years old. And uh, they want to reach them regardless uh, medium, they, they are okay reaching it with TV or via radio or via web. So they don't care, they just want to reach this audience. And how to consolidate all this information from different source, it's I think the biggest challenge right now for all uh, automators of creating audiences and stuff, so, because there is no one source of information about audience. It's very fragmented and uh, it's, so, it's, it's getting harder. <laughs> but, but thank you very much. That's a very uh, interesting and uh, detailed response. I appreciate it, uh, given the fact that I also have worked a little bit in that type of field. Um, uh, you have a long uh, work history in uh, software, software engineering management, uh, uh, architecture. I'm just wondering, uh, do you have any advice for some of our younger uh, colleagues uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, career path as well as uh, work in uh, the, the software or software enabled kind of technology fields? Such questions always start. <laughs> uh, I just, I love what, what I do. I love testing and uh, I envision that my occupation will always be related to testing. Maybe like management or strategies or like testing. Like I, I don't test now like very often. Uh, 
I just do it for fun. Sometimes I like sneak one hour in my week just to do testing because I want to do it. So I think if you love what you do, it will come naturally. Uh, if you don't, it probably will never come because, like, you know, if you love something, you invest time at work and uh, after work, and you're actually excited about what you do. And if you're excited, it's it's easy and it brings joy and it brings careers achievement. That's what I think. So find something that you are excited about. Well, thank you very much on that one. And uh, um, obviously you, you join us uh, outside of the United States. A lot of our attendees uh, and meetup participants are in the US. Um, what, what do you think of the uh, state of uh, uh, software development um, in terms of uh, kind of the rapid internationalizations of, of the folks that participate in projects. Uh, do you see any um, challenges in terms of uh, working with folks that are across uh, broad geography? And then, of course, last year, a lot of us have to work from home because of COVID, um, deep use of or, or daily extensive use of technology. Has that has any of that affected your work and your interaction with your colleagues, both uh, locally and then perhaps internationally? Uh, I'm excited that we now can work with people from different uh, countries and different cultural backgrounds because sometimes people think differently. They, based on their cultural background, there are different approaches and different schools of test testing and software developers. So, so I, I, I like to work with people who located in different geographical location and have different ways to think. And last year, of course, was challenging and I am eager to meet people in person again. Although I am a very introverted person, I don't need much socializing. But uh, I think what we lost when we start to work from home, it's like conversation that just happen naturally because there is there are no like talks in the lunch room or near a uh, water cooler when you randomly meet a person and he says oh i have this problem or i have this interesting idea and you start talking and after this you have like something exciting happening like moving to another project starting to work on another uh, uh i don't know tool or some idea you implement or some improvements that you never thought about. And sometimes even some advices that can be like, they can sound very simple, but you did not think about them for some reason. So I miss this conversation, this ad hoc conversation, because you usually do not start slacking random people like, oh, I have this idea or I thought about it. It happens naturally. So plus, some things are much easier to solve in office, like when you can actually stop and like talk to person and just sit next to and you like, code together or you debug together. Technologies kinda enable it, but just kinda. Because like you might have simple question and you need to select the person and that person went to the to lunch and uh, you know you can then he comes back and says that he don't know you need to ask another person so like finding answer in the for the simple questions can take half a day although like in the real environment you may be like just turn your head and ask do you know this and okay yeah I know that so <laughs> so I miss uh. A conversation and especially I miss them to be honest on the um, during the conferences like I really hope that this year conferences will be in person because most of the knowledge and most interesting conversation from my perspective happens uh, again in aisles during the lunch break uh, when you meet people and they start sharing knowledge inspired by conference presentation, inspired by talks. But when you start like talking and digging deep, it's where magic happens. <laughs> That's my perspective. Well, I appreciate that perspective. Um, and, you know, 
PNSQC as an organization is uh, trying to decide if our October conference this year um, should be virtual only or hybrid uh, with a physical component uh, still taking place uh, simultaneously in, in Portland, Oregon, um, the traditional home for PNSQC. Um, you know, we hope to update everybody as the, you know, more vetting and decision making is done. Um, the, I, I'm curious, uh, this is kind of a, a question maybe is top of mind on a lot of folks that's been working from home in the last year, but for your company um, or maybe people that you know in your vicinity, um, do they plan to go back to a uh, pre-COVID office work environments or do they uh, gonna like start allowing much more telework? I think it will be much more uh, telework, at least for people I communicate with, like uh, from my like personal, like from my fr my friends, my husband, I. Uh, none of the companies we work with are required like full time presence on site. Some of them have not decided yet. Like for example, for us, we also like we know that it will be some hybrid, but we did not. No, do not know any details. We know that offices will be open in September, but we don't know how how we communicate, how how we how much time we need to commute, how much time we can spend at home. Uh, some companies did like a survey, and uh, people just said like I will be coming to the office two times a week uh, or once per month uh, or never one of my friends said like no <laughs> i don't want it anymore so uh, so i think it's based company from company to company it is different from company to company but i don't think we are coming back at least like pure technology companies right right um i like I to think kind it of it will be not the same some finance banks maybe Right, right. May I uh, invite any additional questions from the floor? Um, there are not too many of us left on this call at this point in time. Um, just a dozen or so people um, wondering if anyone may have uh, any question that they want to raise before we let our uh, guests uh, go. Um, and now is your chance. Uh, um, Anyway, um, I'm going to give it one second. Well, seeing that there may not be any more additional questions, um, you know, I, uh, you know, I feel I have to go earlier. You know, I'm um, for those of us that don't know me, I'm, I'm Yinky Kuang. I'm uh, one of the volunteers as well as board member for the Pacific Northwest Software Quality Conference. Um, you know, uh, Bill would have wanted to stay uh, till the end, but uh, he has a client meeting. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we really appreciate uh, Yorana giving a very uh, interesting talk and for the uh, uh, interesting information and discussion that we have uh, doing Q&A. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Um, you know, we, 